You're watching the show that puts mid-Michigan news in focus. This is Focal Point. Coming up on Focal Point, find out what happened here at MSU's College of Engineering. MSU commencements begin next Friday here in the Breslin Center, and some people are rushing to the union to get those last-minute items. Tonight on Focal Point, find out what's happening here at the Wharton Center and the upcoming season. Focal Point starts now. Good evening, I'm Kevin Burrows. And I'm T.R. Morocco. Welcome to Focal Point. State legislators are right now discussing a possible increase in minimum wage after President Obama has been pushing for a federal wage, wage hike. Focal Point's David DeFever finds out if the positives outweigh the negatives. The magic number is just over 258,000 signatures. The amount needed for a chance to raise the minimum wage from this to this by this. It may seem like a good idea, but small businesses think otherwise. Mike Marzano, policy advisor for the Small Business Association of Michigan, doesn't support what people are pushing for. Well, we see positives and negatives, but for the most part, it's going to hurt our small businesses. So we, we are, right now, we are opposed to this. It's businesses like this that would take the biggest hit. So much in Michigan has happened over the last few years to help our economic state, to help our small businesses. We see a lot of growth in our small businesses. We don't want something that's going to hinder them again. And it's possible that some businesses would no longer be open. We have heard about some businesses that say if this goes through, we're going to have to, we're going to, have to shut our doors. We can't afford this. One business that could see that happen is Lamb's Gate Antiques in Old Town Lansing. Owner Carol Lamb has been in business for over 14 years and is weary about what could happen to her antique shop if minimum wage went up. I have mixed feelings, but for a business the size of mine, really small, we only have two employees, it would, it would hurt us. Um, it, it would just really make it hard. If Lamb was looking to hire someone, the rate would be too much. If I had to hire in somebody at a higher wage than that, it would be really hard for, for us. On the other side of things, if passed, the initiated law would be very beneficial, says Yannette Lathrop from the Michigan League of Public Policy. Well, everyone deserves to be paid a, a living wage, and I think raising the wage to 1010 really gets us close to that. So is there more to gain than lose? The, the benefits of the increase outweigh what could possibly be the costs of it. 740 an hour is just not enough to make ends meet anymore. I'm sure Jordan Colley would agree with that as well. Working for minimum wage and over 70 hours a week between two jobs, Colley is still trying to make ends meet. It's hard to pay the bills with the money that I'm making right now. And he seems to always be at work. Yeah, I work a lot of hours um, at both jobs. And if there was an increase in minimum wage, uh, I wouldn't have to work so much. I could take a little time for myself. And save some money along the way too. Yeah, it, it would mean I not only could pay my bills, but I could also put some money into savings and, uh, you know, plan for the future. So whether you're a small business owner or someone trying to get by, minimum wage has its ups and downs. For Focal Point, I'm David DeFever. Petitioners have until May 28th to get signatures collected. If the set amount is reached, we could see this proposal on the ballot come November. Young leaders are calling to state lawmakers to make policy change. Focal Point's Nis Blaskowski is caught up with the students who walked 80 miles from Detroit to Lansing for an issue they face every day. What do you want? Education! They called themselves gladiators. For nearly three days, these students walked and walked. Let's do it. Almost done. And walked. They're hoping their small steps will make a giant leap in state legislature. What do you want? Education! What do you want it? Joined by supporters, they're drawing attention to change the state's zero tolerance policy. Well, the zero tolerance policy uh, should be modified because it should take out trivial suspensions for like kids getting kicked out of school uh, for not having the right ID badge or not having the proper clothing on. 16-year-old Michael Reynolds was suspended from Loyola High School for seven days for not having that student ID. 80 miles from Detroit, we're at last at the Capitol! Yeah! Reynolds is the co-president of the Youth Voice, and he started the walk between Detroit and the Capitol building. The 80-mile walk convened here on the steps of the state capitol, where these students hope their message against zero tolerance policy will be addressed by state lawmakers. William Frey is a facilitator at Neutral Zone, a teen center in Ann Arbor. 
he isn't neutral when it comes to schools instituting a zero tolerance policy. It's affecting certain students and then they, they tend to drop out more and then that, that feeds the, the prison system. You know? So the school to prison pipeline is definitely directly related to all of these situations and I think that it's really, really important that we keep that in mind when we think about these things. Pastor David Galbraith, the director of the Harriet Tubman Center, was on hand to show his support as well. These kids are rock stars. You know, they could have been doing anything. They could have been laying home playing video games, but, but they saw that there was an issue that needs to be brought to the attention of the people who can make a difference. When we remove kids from school for minor offenses... The rally got the attention of Maura Corrigan, the Michigan Director of Human Services, who agrees schools do engage in wrongful suspensions. What happened? I agree with you. Our kids deserve a quality education. We know that children in Michigan are dropping out of school because of strict zero-tolerance laws. While the efforts of these students like may not be felt right away, it certainly could be said that they got the ball rolling. For Focal Point, I'm Nick Laskowski. Director Corrigan announced she is already working with lawmakers to introduce legislation changing zero tolerance, which could be introduced as soon as May. Michigan abortion laws have sparked controversy throughout the greater Lansing area. Focal Point's Michaela Cummings tells us how MSU students are raising their voices. We should warn you, some of the images you are about to see could be disturbing. Students are rallying, Woo! protesting, and standing up for what they believe is right when it comes to the issue of sexual assault, with abortion being the main topic of discussion. April marks Sexual Assault Awareness Month, and as you can see, I'm standing across the street from the MSU Auditorium, where students and organizations have gathered to take their stance on whether or not they are pro-choice or pro-life. The MSU Students for Life organization brought in help to show the reality of abortion through the Genocide Project. Our main purpose with the Genocide Awareness Project is uh, twofold, to show the humanity of the unborn child and to show that abortion is an act of violence that decapitates and dismembers little human beings. In order to do that, images such as these were displayed on campus to compare genocide to abortion. I feel like what they're doing is disgusting. It's going to be a trigger for some people, and people need to know what's going on, and that it's not comparable to genocide even just a little bit. While MSU Students for Choice had a different take on things. Sorry you guys had to see that. I'm sorry. The question of why these images are used is argued on both sides. I think the pro-choice movement gets a bad rap sometimes, and I want to show that we, you know, like our peaceful protests are better than we're better than putting up images of dead babies. You know, we believe that using those graphic images is the only way to really be able to change the hearts and minds of people to get them to understand our issues. Whether they're fighting to make their own choices or fighting for a life, these two groups make sure everyone has a voice. For Focal Point, I'm Michaela Cummings. To learn more about Michigan's abortion laws, search for the Michigan Department of Community Health at www.michigan.gov. A new trend in alcohol production is being called illegal. Powdered alcohol, or alcohol, gained national attention when Alcohol and Tobacco Tax and Trade Bureau approved the substance. Soon after, a spokesman for the company said the approval was an error. The makers of alcohol say the decision was reversed because of the label clear on how much powder is in their packages. They are now working on new labels to resubmit. Michigan Clean Water Action is honoring a Michigan congressman for his efforts to protect the Great Lakes. The 2014 Great Lakes Lifetime Achievement Award was given to Congressman John Dingle. Congressman Dingle has spent much of his career trying to protect the Great Lakes by drafting and supporting many different policies. The award was given to him in celebration of Earth Day during a ceremony at Hopcat in East Lansing on Tuesday. Hopcat's managing director, Gary Boyd, also received an award for its efforts to reduce waste and less energy consumption. The East Lansing community gathers to celebrate the life of one MSU's biggest fan. Lacey Holsworth, or Princess Lacey as she's known on campus, recently died of cancer. Some of the thousands who came out to her memorial started with a dinner at Buffalo Wild Wings. The East Lansing restaurant where Lacey was a regular customer has been accepting donations throughout the past couple of months. The funds go to the Holsworth family to pay for medical costs. The staff also handed out pink bracelets and t-shirts for Lacey. After the dinner, there was a walk to the Presence Center where there was a start of a memorial. 
As for the memorial itself, nearly 2,500 people celebrated the life of Lacey. Last Thursday, the memorial service held at the Breslin Center gave family, friends, and fans an opportunity to remember and honor Lacey. Focal Point's Connor Wilton was there to bring us the sights and the sounds. She smiled and showed love without hesitation. No matter what battle she was fighting or adversity she faced. She was shy yet outgoing, competitive yet sweet, a tomboy with a tutu, graceful but silly, little but strong, and composed yet wild. One finger up, there's a booger. One tiny booger, and he said, I've got you where I want ya, now I'm gonna eat ya. Oh, now I just ate a booger. This isn't the Jack Breslin Student Event Center. This is Princess Lacey's Palace. Well, I just want to thank, on behalf of the team, the whole Holesworth family, um, for having such an impact on us and our family and our basketball family. I like to go and watch my big brother Adrian play basketball. He plays basketball for Michigan State. Is he pretty cool? Yeah. We're selfish, Lacey. We wanted you to stay with us, yet we cherish the lessons that you give us. And I use present tense because you're still touching lives. And I can say personally, you'll forever touch mine. Hi, Daddy. I'm going to beat my record, and it's going to be legendary. You are dancing among angels in the most stunning palace. You have a beautiful crown and a smile that is radiant. Lacey, we love you. What an amazing tribute to such a special little girl. Our condolences go out to Lacey's family and friends. Up next, the MSU Board of Trustees recently approved a price hike for students living on campus next fall. And it's the end of the year and professors are awaiting feedback from students. Mara Thompson has more next on campus. There are moments of triumph, of discovery, and achievement. But what makes these moments possible? It's the early mornings, the late nights. It's having the will to persevere. So let's take a moment to celebrate. But more importantly, let's salute the will it takes to get there. Spartans will. They've been called leaders, lifesavers, and world changers. They're also called Spartans. living on MSU's campus next year will be faced with bigger bills to pay. And the marching band will have a new stomping ground for practice for the next season. Mara Thompson is here with those stories and more. Mara? Students living on campus next fall will see a jump in room and board. Michigan State University is increasing the rate by almost 4%. They say it's due to a recent remodeling and a rise in operating costs. Students living at University Village will also see an increase, but rates for Spartan Village residents will stay the same. The Eli and Edith Broad Art Museum received another big donation last week. The museum received a $5 million donation from alumni Eli Broad and his wife Edith. The donation was a gift in honor of Michael Rush, the founding director. The couple has donated $33 million total, with a donation of $28 million to the Museum for Construction and Design. The $40 million museum opened in 2012 and has welcomed over 125,000 visitors since. The donation will help with the endowment and exhibits for the next five years. The end of the school year is almost here. That means students are preparing for finals, but if those students want to see their grades as quickly as possible, they also need to spend time evaluating their teachers. Focal Point's Tiara Morocco has the story. They come at the end of every semester and must be filled out if students want their grades on time. The SIRS, or Student Instructional Rating System, is a way for students to provide feedback for their instructors. Grad student Nyla Hughes takes time to fill them out because she thinks that they make a positive impact. The course material is learned at different paces for different students, of course, and depending on enough, if there was enough time given to learn, let's say, a software program, for example, then that student may think that the course was either moving too fast or too slow. 
While well, students have the option to not fill out their SIRS, it not only delays receiving their grades, but also impacts the future of their professors. Two things, really. One is it's feedback for us so we can become better teachers, and we do care about how well we teach. And I'm, I'm not sure that everybody understands that. And then two, it affects people's livelihood. Professor Bob Albers explains how SIRS are important and greatly affect teachers' lives. And there are really specific guidelines about for fixed-term faculty about how uh, how well you have to do on the SERS forms, even in terms of the, the specific numbers that are required. So I know that students don't recognize that it is a really important thing that, and that it affects other people's lives, but it does. For fixed-term faculty who are on contract, the ratings tend to mean more because feedback can decide whether they get hired back from year to year. And if you don't have data for that performance evaluation, and if you don't have SIRS on top of that, or if you don't have enough SIRS because only a few students in the class filled it out, um, that can certainly be a problem and it can start to raise questions when in reality, the cause of students not filling out the SIRS may have nothing to do with the professor's performance. Elizabeth Pellerito, staff leader at the Union of Non-Tenure Track Faculty, works with the union to represent 550 fixed-term faculty members. Part of the strength of a union is that we can come together and negotiate a contract that applies to everybody. So one of the things in our contract says that in order to be evaluated, you should have certain benchmarks that you that your department meets when they're thinking about evaluations. Students may forget to fill them out or just not take them seriously. However, they do not realize how much power their feedback holds. For Focal Point, I'm T.R. Morocco. All students are encouraged to fill out their SIRS forms. You can find them at sirsonline.msu.edu. Each semester, engineering students get a chance to showcase their skills during design day. It's an event filled with team projects from student-produced games to company-sponsored designs. It's the one day a semester that engineering students get a break from the classroom. While you're in the classroom, a lot of what you do is just the numbers and just crunching math and manipulating equations and such. And the, Professor Thompson actually wanted us to get out there and do it. You're first. You're ready for it, right? Students from all 10 engineering majors filled the building, displaying projects to teachers, parents, companies, and high school students. Yeah! So being able to go down there and actually do it, and then being able to come to Design Day and display what we've been working on for about a month is really exciting. Students at Design Day said their favorite thing was getting down to the shop and actually building projects like this one. Hey! The point of the game is to try and make it to the Rose Bowl by, sh by defeating Michigan, Ohio State, and then Stanford. While the work on display might be working flawlessly, it didn't get here without hurdles along the way. We had some problems where we had to remake some things because they didn't work as well as we wanted to, but um, that's all part of the learning process. At the end of the day, something has to actually work. Associate Dean Thomas Wolf says Design Day is about giving students real-world experience. The idea that you're doing real things that affect real people, I think, is what's most important to the students. But for students, it's about having fun. It's really cool teaching the kids about mechanical engineering and also having them come play our game and just see people smile and have fun. Design Day started 20 years ago with only mechanical engineering students. It has since grown to include over 600 students and all 10 majors. Turf's up at Munn Field. The former practice space is getting a much needed makeover. The new turf field will be used by the Spartan Marching Band. They currently practice at Dem Hall Field. That area of grass gets muddy sometimes and can be dangerous for band members. The field will be ready in August, just in time for the 2014 marching season. A retired piano professor is finally carrying out one of his long-term goals by playing some of his favorite pieces in the Fairchild Auditorium. Focal Point's Tyler Clifford shows us how Ralph Vodapak is still making music and performing. Most piano recitals feature work by one specific composer. It helps give a theme to the show. But 
Retired MSU professor of piano Ralph Vodapik finds it hard to dedicate one show to one composer. He doesn't have a specialty. When somebody asks me, Who's, what's your favorite piece, that's just impossible. That's impossible to answer. I have many, many, many favorite pieces. So he plays what he likes. He does an annual piano recital, usually done in the music building on campus. But, but this is the first year that he performs in the Fairchild Auditorium. Now that Fairchild's remodeled, that seems like an ideal place. Piano's first rate and uh, acoustics are wonderful. Some of his favorite composers' works that he performed included pieces by Beethoven, Schumann, Brahms, and Ravel. Or in mind has to be prolific. Second of all, they have to be very influential on later composers. And third, they just uh, have to write what most people consider uh, great music. There's maybe very few composers that fit all categories. While most songs he performed were classical, he ended the show with a jazz piece that delighted the audience. This is uh, Nikolai Kapustin's Andante. Uh, it was fantastic. It was uh, very jazzy. And being a jazz lover myself, I was very, very impressed. It was so lyrical. And Ralph Oderbeck is one of the greatest pianists. I'm, I'm sure of that. Vodapak knows doing what he loves will always be great. For Focal Point, I'm Tyler Clifford. We are just months away from the start of a new season at the Wharton Center. As Focal Point's Kevin Burroughs finds out, there are a lot of new acts in store. I'm here with Bob Hoffman, the Public Relations Manager here at the Wharton Center, and we're going to discuss the 2014-2015 schedule for the upcoming season. Bob, can you give me a little bit of update on what's going on? Yes, yeah, so today we announced our new season, the 2014-15 season, like you said, and uh, we have the best of Broadway once again and the best of performing arts. Um, when we talk about Broadway, we have Once, which you've probably heard about the movie. It's a Tony Award winning Broadway show as well. We have Pippin coming, which is I think my personal favorite. Um, Stephen Schwartz Pippin. It's been redone a little bit. It's really cool. It's all acrobatic. It's Cirque du Soleil-ish. It's a lot of fun. Um, we have Phantom of the Opera coming back. And has been here several times in the past, but what's unique about this is they've reworked it and they're using a lot of modern technology in it that hasn't been uh, you know, seen before. You know, In the last several years, theater productions and concert productions have really been able to use and incorporate a lot of modern technology to make the experience even grander, and so Phantom is using that. And then we have the 2013 Tony Award winning show, Kinky Boots. Based on a true story, it's a lot of fun, and uh, I think audiences are really going to love it. And we have Blue Man Group, and I love Lucy. That's just the Broadway. We have also performing arts attractions as well. Everything from Yitzhak Perlman, David Sedaris, the Reduced Shakespeare Company. Whatever you can think of, we're going to have at Wharton Center because we have the best of entertainment uh, anywhere. The, when is everything open? What's the date? Oh my gosh, so the first date of the season is September 15th and Michelle Norris, NPR um, a commentator Michelle Norris is going to be uh, the first the first act of the season. Awesome, great. Thanks so much for being with me, Bob. Really yeah, appreciate thank it. You, Kevin. Have a great day. Okay. Tickets for the 2014 season are on sale at the WhartonCenter.com. While you're there, you can sign up for the Wharton Center's e-club for deals on great seats, early ticket sales, and more. A 15-foot-tall Norway spruce now stands outside the MSU Union in honor of Arbor Day. This year marks 142 years of the tree planting holiday. It was started by Julius Sterling Morton, a journalist who encouraged people to learn about the importance of trees. It's replacing the historic tree planted in 1865 that blew over during an ice storm last November. And we thought what a better way to, to celebrate Arbor Day and to give recognition and pay homage to these old trees that unfortunately we're losing over time and to plant another Norway spruce up here on the campus. 
There's less than a week to go before graduates walk across the stage at commencements. Focal Point's Tia Graham shows us how some are racing against the clock, getting what they need for the big day. Here at the MSU Union, Spartans are preparing for a graduation with a little bit of last minute shopping. But for many graduating seniors, this time of the year comes with a lot of emotion. MSU packaging major Steven Twitchell says he is ready for graduation. It's kind of bittersweet, I mean, that I'm leaving, so I'm kind of going to be sad about that, but I'm kind of happy that I'm going to be done. And looking forward to the future, Renia Timmons, social science major, can't stop smiling about the big day. I'm excited that the journey is coming to an end, honestly, and I'm moving on to, you know, a different part of life. Commencements begins next Friday in the Breslin Center, and for most, including myself, can't wait for that day to come. As for tackling that next biggest hurdle? I'm moving to Kansas to work for Rubbermaid. I have a job interview set up. Um, I'm planning on moving to D.C. I'm planning on working in the U.S. House of Representatives. These two are ready for the next step. I'm really excited. I don't, I'm kind of all over the place. I'm kind of anxious, a little nervous, excited. Um, I don't really know how to feel yet. You know, just anticipation. For Focal Point, I'm Tia Graham. Caps and gowns are still in stock at the MSU Union Shop for $36. That's what's happening on campus. I'm Mara Thompson. The MSU football team is getting ready for their annual green and white spring game. And two players from Michigan universities could be headed to the NBA in the upcoming draft. When I was green. It's spring practice time for the MSU football team. They're getting ready for their first big game of the season. The Rose Bowl champs, champs are playing Saturday for the annual green and white game. Coaches selected the seniors who then drafted the underclassmen for each team. The teammates will play against each other, allowing for a friendly competition and bragging rights. They go head to head Saturday at 2. Even the guys that are on the same line, defensive or offensive, you know, all of a sudden they're on opposite mm -hmm. sides and the same old deal that, you know, hey, it, it's football, you're going to compete. It's a great way to go out and do spring ball. I mean, some co coaches don't allow that to happen, but having a draft and get the kids involved and also the staff having an opportunity to experience that, I think is terrific. And Sophomore guard Gary Harris announced that he will forego his final two years at MSU to enter the NBA draft. Coach Tom Izzo said in a statement that he supports Harris's decision, saying he believes Harris will be a high pick in the draft and is well prepared for an NBA career. Harris became the third player in MSU basketball history to reach the 1,000 point mark as a sophomore behind Magic Johnson and Mike Robinson, averaging 16.7 points per game. Harris said that the decision wasn't easy, but an opportunity that he couldn't pass up. It's more of myself. I feel like I've grown a lot as a person, you know. I've definitely matured on and off the court a lot more, you know. This year definitely benefited me. And, um, you know, once you pass up on your dream one time, you know, you never know if you're going to get that chance again. While the loss of Harris is a big blow for the Spartans, forward Brandon Dawson recently announced he will be returning next season. Dawson was the leading rebounder for the Spartans last year. Another sophomore with his eyes in the NBA draft is U of M forward Mitch McGarry. This comes after failing an NCAA-administered drug test, resulting in a one-year suspension. McGarry tested positive for marijuana during the Sweet 16 of the NCAA tournament. McGarry says he regrets the decision and wants to put it behind him. A new soccer team is kicking off in Lansing this summer. Lansing United will be the National Premier Soccer League's newest team. They'll play at the East Lansing Soccer Complex. The team is mainly comprised of college athletes, four of them being current MSC players. The owner, Jeremy Sampson, is a former sports reporter who covered Lansing sports for over 15 years. Even though the team has yet to make or take the field, Sampson says there has already been a ton of interest in the team. Yeah, the interest has been overwhelming, to be honest with you. Almost 1,300 likes on our Facebook page. Uh, we have almost 800 followers on Twitter. Uh, we've sold, as I mentioned, over 170 season tickets already. And we still have uh, three weeks to go before the season starts. The team hosted season opener on Friday, May 16th, against the Westfield Select. 
The MSU softball season is coming to an end with only six games left in the regular season. A rougher season than most. The women are currently 4-13 in the conference and 12-30 and overall. With a three-game series against number two Nebraska and number five Northwestern, the team is looking to gain some ground in the Big Ten before the Big Ten tournament in early May. Michigan State University is hosting the Big Ten men's tennis tournament this year. MSU defeated Nebraska in the first round, 4-0, and faced number one seeded Ohio State earlier, this, or earlier today. Unfortunately, the Spartans lost to the Buckeyes 4-2. Matches will continue to be played throughout the weekend. Here's what Coach Gene Orlando had to say about the team's efforts. It was a great, great fight. You know, the guys uh, played very hard. And, you know, just a lot of credit to the seniors. You know, they brought a strong work ethic and, and uh, you know, really, you know, brought today. And, uh, you know, it really encouraged the team to, to dig deeper and go further than they thought they could. That's all for sports. I'm Connor Wilton. It's senior week here at MSU, and it started all with an opportunity to take pictures with Sparty. On Monday, seniors dressed up in their caps and gowns and signed to, up to win prizes while waiting for that special photo. Students posed in front of the original Sparty statue with Sparty, the mascot, by their side. Multiple student organizations held events every day this week to get seniors involved before they leave campus. When you leave MSU and someone asks you, like, what was, like, your favorite part or, like, do you know your school well? They can say, yeah, I was like a really big part of it or had, had that feeling that even though you went to a 48,000 person school, you felt like it's more like individualized and everyone had that big Spartan family experience. Senior week ended Friday with a chance for seniors to leave a message on the rock. Thanks for watching our last show with us tonight. We leave you now with sounds from pianist Ralph Vodapek. We really enjoyed telling you stories throughout the semester. Good night.